Well, I feel like that's a really tough act to follow up in the last couple of days. Lots of really interesting people talking about a lot of stuff. And um, I really wanted to say thank you first. So um, first, thanks so much to David and David and Bruce for implementing uh, Java Client and Tor. I mean, you guys are some of the most badass hackers on the planet. Thanks for making free software. And thanks to the Ecuadorian government and the Ecuadorian people for giving Julian Assange asylum and for helping Snowden to stay alive. I think saving the lives of these two guys is a really badass thing to do, really good. So thank you so much for making that possible. I know Julian is a really difficult guy, you know, so I just want to say that you shouldn't uh, take the Australian part of Julian so personally. He's sometimes very difficult, but thank you really for saving his life because if it was not for Ecuador giving him political asylum, he would probably have a bullet in the back of his head. So you guys have really made a big difference, and I really thank you for saving my friend's life. So um, I had a couple things that I wanted to talk about with you. The big one is about spying, because I feel like that's uh, an interesting topic right now. Some of you may be interested in that. And I've been working, um, living in a kind of self-imposed exile in Germany. I live in Berlin right now. I'm originally from the United States. I was born near San Francisco. Not San Francisco de Quito, but San Francisco, uh, Mexico, Acapado. Um, and so I, um, you know, I, I feel like there are a lot of things I could talk about. And what I really like to do is not just talk for an hour. I actually really hate talking for an hour, despite the fact that I had 11 cups of coffee today. And I could talk for an hour. Um, but I'm hoping that some of you will have questions, and I'm really hoping that this is a safe enough space that everybody here will feel comfortable asking questions. And maybe I only need to talk for about 30 minutes, and then you guys can ask some questions, and if there's something useful that I can contribute, um, I would really prefer to do that. I think just talking can be really irritating, and not just for me, but it can be really boring for a lot of you. Um, but that said, I wanna talk a bit about some of the revelations. So the basic bad news is that the whole world is under surveillance. We sort of had some idea of this for the last 20 years and really before that. But we have entered an era that we have not had previously, which is an era in which it is possible to surveil not just whole populations of cities or even countries, but actually the whole planet. And so the bad news brought to us by one Edward Snowden is in a sense, good news, because it allows us to begin to talk about whether or not we want this kind of spying, whether or not we want the trade-offs that led to this spying being possible. And it allows us to start to build not only um, a protest movement, but a resistance movement. And actually, more importantly, beyond resistance, into building alternatives to the systems and to the structures that exist today. So first, I want to describe a little bit of how the surveillance works. So raise your hand if you have an email address or a cell phone. Right, some of you, bank account, right? Okay, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, I really would love to talk with you later because I don't know how you exist on the planet or what you do, but presumably um, you use some kind of electronic communication, you browse the web, um, if you have computers, I assume a lot of you do, you, you pay the rent at the house, you go to the grocery store, you buy things, you have to deal with governments, you have to deal with, for example, your own government with having identification, the way this surveillance works is imagine that our little pale blue dot of a world is floating in front of you. And now imagine that all of the times that anyone is ever communicating, this information travels between different points. And in between these points, and sometimes at the points themselves, there are devices that look at the data. And what they do is they look for keywords or they look for what are called selectors. Now, <clears throat> as I choke, pardon me. Uh, selectors are things like your email address or your phone number or the fact that you had a word in a text message. And the way that these systems work, now first of all, we, this particular dragnet surveillance system that I'm talking about with regard to the internet is part of a thing called the turbulence architecture. Turbulence um, is a code word for a program that hasn't really been discussed in public yet, but I'm working on some journalistic endeavors that will explain it. There's a system as a part of the turbulence architecture that is called turmoil. Turmoil is a passive SIGINT solution. That is, it's a signals intelligence solution that looks at all of the data that passes by, and it looks through this data for things that are interesting, like your email address. 
So for example, if you're Julian Assange and you have Julian's email address, you can bet, though we don't know for sure, that Julian's email, when it flows by, or even if in the body of an email, his email is mentioned, that would be selected out of the stream and stored. So instead of thinking about wiretapping, right? Everybody has this idea of wiretapping from movies, you know, like the FBI has a guy listening with a headset, right? And he's, you know, he hears a person, and it's, you know, one guy spying on one person. We've moved from that era to a world of whole life monitoring. So instead of just having one guy watching another guy, we have machines that automatically watch everybody all of the time where they have coverage. This is a fundamental shift in, in humanity that we had not seen before. And this is going along at the same time with the ability to do whole population surveillance. So this is a really scary transition because it happened without any democratic oversight whatsoever by intelligence agencies largely that exist outside of the rule of law. So that to me is a little bit terrifying because generally speaking, that lack of transparency with that m amount of power, it just doesn't go well. And so sure enough, part of the reporting that I've been working on, I revealed with Der Spiegel that Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, the most powerful woman in the world, unless you count the Brazilian president, but of the two, it turns out the NSA spied on both of them. And we revealed this about Angela Merkel, and the key thing that people didn't understand, and that is important to clarify, is that it wasn't just that her phone was being surveilled by the NSA. It was that Angela Merkel herself was tasked for surveillance. So what that means is that there's a thing called an NSRL, or a National SIGINTS Requirement Listing, and her tasking order was under NSRL 2002-388. That's the 388th NSRL of the year 2002. Well, it's, what year is it now? 2013? Well, as it just so happens, she's not the only person that was tasked. That NSRL covers many people in German society, and she had been under surveillance, or this NSRL has been in existence since 2002. So it tells you about an ongoing pervasive dragnet surveillance where her phone was one of the selectors, but only one of them. So every time she talked with someone, every time she wrote an email, she sent a text message, these passive turmoil sensors would pick that information up and put it into a database, put it into different systems that the NSA uses to collect, to correlate, to analyze, and to, in some cases, interfere. Now, there are other selectors so for example, the IMEI of a cell phone, the unique identifier, this is one of those things as well that could be underneath a tasking order. And the way to think about it is everything that's uniquely identifying about you and your life, those would be selectors for you. So what, what this tells us is that when someone is able to watch the world all at once, they're able to pull this stuff out. And that means that if you're watching Netflix, for example, they might know that you're watching that. Or if you're watching YouTube, they would know that you're watching that. And it doesn't mean that a human will actually understand that right on the spot. But what it does tell us is that all of the important semantic information is extracted. And in some cases, if you're really an interesting target like Merkel, then all the data itself is also extracted and stored. And basically what we've learned is that the NSA keeps records on everybody on the entire planet that comes across these sensors, that has unique identifiers, and that falls within a social graph of three hops. So if Merkel is spied upon, that basically means three hops away from Chancellor Merkel is everyone in the German parliament. And the NSA has openly talked about some of this, defending it, saying, well, we don't spy on Americans. Now, I know that you guys are in South America, but they don't mean that kind of American. So, Raise your hand if you're an American in the audience, right? So everybody else, you're fucked. And that's what they're saying, right? Is that you're someone they can spy on, they don't care about your fundamental human rights, and it turns out that the only thing that you can do is have legal processes that will protect you. And it is only with strong encryption that you may be able to ensure that the legal process is the one that is used to extract data like this from a network. Because what the NSA fundamentally is doing is the same job that every intelligence agency all around the world would like to be doing, and they try. So the Chinese, the Russians, the Germans, everybody, especially the British, the British are probably the worst of all, I mean, they are a monarchy, and <clears throat> fundamentally, that kind of surveillance that we see, it's, it's a shift that is being taken. So the basic proposition, well actually it's a shift that was taken, and we just learned about it 10 years later, 
But the basic proposition is they spy on everything all the time. They break into any computers that they'd like, and you just have to sit there and take it and love it. So the proposition is that they'll be able to do this, and that will make the world a better place, fundamentally. And this is, I think, a really scary proposition because it happens outside of the rule of law, or it happens under the, the let's say, the purview of a judge that still has their email printed out by a secretary and then read to them. So these are people that are really disconnected from the decisions that they're making in some cases. So this proposition fundamentally, though, is about spying. And they're basically saying, we want to spy on everything all the time. And what I would propose is that if you want to win and to continue to have privacy, and thus to have agency, and thus to actually continue to have a democracy, you have to reject this proposition. You have to say, actually, what we don't want is spying. And you have to switch to a different discussion point, which is to say that you're going to give up the addiction to wiretapping, give up the spying, and instead, you're going to switch it to one where you say, we're going to secure computers, we're going to make it so people can't break into those computers as best as we know, where wiretapping will not produce useful information, where we protect the metadata of people by either hiding it or by ensuring that it is uh, compartmentalized away or removed entirely, depending on the way that the systems are architected. And by playing a different game, I think that anyone that makes that choice, they're much better off. So for example, if Ecuador chooses to take the proposition from the US and they want to deploy giant wiretapping systems, they want to be able to spy on everyone all the time, what fundamentally people have to understand is that when Patino said that the age of empire was over, we would have to ask ourselves if it really is. Because empire is more than just a few countries. Empire is a way of thinking about the hierarchy of the world. Well, so if you choose the spying angle, the age of empire is not over. And the reason is because whatever you choose for Ecuador, when it is possible for Ecuador to perform this spying, the NSA will have already beaten the Ecuadorians to doing the spying. And fundamentally, any legal process that Ecuador has for spying, the NSA doesn't care about the legal process. Neither does the GCHQ. In fact, quite the opposite. They want you to play the same game as them because that game is one where they always win. They have the resources, they have the analysts, they have the technological deployments. For example, here we know that there's a special collection service run by the NSA. That is, probably if you look at the US Embassy here, you would probably see dielectric walls. So they sort of look like uh, the panel of the ceiling here, where you, know, you would expect to see a window, but instead you see a wall. We published um, some photos of the US Embassy in Berlin where we showed these dielectric panels. Behind them, if you should get a thermal camera, you can see computer racks and antennas, which are hotter than the rest of the surrounding room. And you can actually see the interception gear, even though there's a wall there. Um, if you choose the wiretapping world, if you choose that proposition, fundamentally, you will always be under the boot of the imperialist countries that have also chosen that and have advocated for you to choose that. And it's fascinating because the basic proposition they offer is one where they want to have a vanguard solution for security, where, for example, the NSA will be able to break into any computer, they'll be able to surveil any computer, they'll be able to target any person. And in theory, this kind of makes sense if you want to be able to punish criminals, but the, the bad side is that if you have, for example, an economic discussion between two parties that have these surveillance capabilities, the one that has the better surveillance capabilities will be able to inform the parties in the economic discussion in their favor, probably faster. So we know that this happened in Brazil with the state oil company, and we understand that some of these things have taken place historically between the French and the Americans with regard to Boeing and to Airbus. So if we just disregard human rights for a second and just look at economics, again, this is submitting to the sort of imperialist empire because it suggests that sovereign nations don't exist, that there's a hierarchy, and at the top is the NSA, which is really, to me, as an American, a very shameful thing to have to say, but we don't respect your rights and we don't respect your laws as Americans. And maybe the right thing to do is to recognize that that's the natural order of the world and instead First of all, to reject the bad laws that are being proposed. So for example, Article 474 of the Penal Code, where there's these sections about recording all this information about the internet, about requiring mandatory identification, making sure potentially that there could be a judge involved or something like that. If we architect the internet such that such a law would even be reasonable, that it would even make sense, it is not the Ecuadorians who will really decide what happens with that data. It is someone else, far away, 
who does not care at all for the laws or for your due process. It is fundamentally them who will harvest this information and they'll benefit from it. So when you apply for a visa to go somewhere, or when you want to have a business transaction, or when you wish to live your life in peace here in Ecuador, you may not always be able to make those choices. Your name will show up more and more in their data set. The things that you do will be more and more in their data set. So a much better thing is, for example, to make sure that data retention is a criminal thing instead of a thing which is encouraged. It is significantly better, for example, to reject this idea of noting down and videotaping people when they want to speak freely. It's a much, much better idea to propose laws that enshrine basic rights than it is to essentially follow in the footsteps of some of the worst nations in the world. And these kinds of things, I think, will fundamentally be a much better choice because Ecuador will never beat the NSA or GCHQ at this game. And these kinds of laws fundamentally chill speech, but they also ultimately cement the age of empire as opposed to rejecting it. So I mean, to that, to that end, things like software patents, clearly they're a bad idea because they, you are not the people that possess the majority of the so-called intellectual property. You are the ones that will be oppressed by that. So it is obvious that the right thing to do is to reject these things because they are chains that are designed to bind you to someone else, to their economic realities, and to bind you to their decisions, and essentially through ec economic enslavement, essentially, I mean, to keep you under their boot. And I mean, in some cases, there'll be good trade-offs. For example, or seemingly good trade-offs. When Microsoft makes a deal, it seems like a great deal. You get all of this software. But the reality is that Microsoft's software does not give you the four freedoms. It doesn't give you the freedom to run the software for any purpose. It doesn't give you the freedom uh, basically to study the way that it works. Usually it restricts you. It doesn't give you the freedom to redistribute copies. It doesn't give you the freedom to modify it and to share your modifications with your neighbor. So when you end up taking these deals from companies that want you to have software patents, you end up enslaving yourself not only to these really incredibly bad laws, you actually also enslave yourself to companies who are also in bed with the NSA, as is the case with Microsoft. And fundamentally, instead of controlling the means of production, you, you're stuck with Microsoft. And that's just one kind of simple example, and a much better idea would be to control the means of production, to create free software, and to be able to have control not only of your own computing experience, but of the things that you use these computers to interact with. So for example, the networks here. So, I think, for example, if we were to propose some positive legislation, one of the positive legislation uh, ideas that we could have would be a right to anonymity, that is the right to free speech and the right to read, to make sure that you have the right to anonymize your communications, to make sure that censorship and blocking of information on the internet is something where you should have a private right of action to be able to go after companies that do this, to be able to take some uh, effort in some way, whether it's in a court or, well, maybe there's another way, but probably a court is a good idea. And to be able to ensure that when someone tampers with this, that they are committing a criminal action, that it's, it's abridging one of your rights, and that you should be able to stop them. So for example, instead of giving the police the ability to deploy malware onto your cell phone so that they can spy on you and the people that are around you, should make it so that it's not legal for someone to break into your cell phone, and that includes the police, despite the fact that they supposedly have our best intentions in mind as well as essentially making sure that it's not about data protection, but about people protection. The fact that we have this great internet, in some cases we lose sight of the fact, because there's so much data involved, um, that it's about protecting people fundamentally. So in, in the European Union and the United States, it's often called data protection. That's good, we should talk about that, but better would be to talk about protecting people. So part of that is the person's data, but a much larger part is actually protecting the people fundamentally all the way around, not just in the, the data that, that's there and the data that they may generate or that other companies may have about them, but fundamentally about all of the ways that they may use the internet and ensuring that they have, for example, the right of free passage to be able to read things on the internet. This is also part of people protection, which is often left out of the data protection discussion. So, I mean, uh, there's a really fantastic author by the name of Audrey Lord, and she, she says that you can't destroy the master's house using the master's tools. And so this is fundamentally what I want to echo in, in a 21st century sort of sense. 
which is if you choose the route of spying, if you choose the route of proprietary software, of software patents, of data retention, of logging information, what you're ultimately doing is you are trying to use these criminal tools to legitimize them in the eyes of the rule of law and then to try to create more free people from that. And fundamentally, this just does not work. In fact, you end up with people who are logged, where information about them is stored, where they're open to blackmail, where the NSA will probably break into them. I mean, considering their abilities, it's pretty obvious that you will not be able to secure this data. And fundamentally, this takes you to a place where you are not only less free based on the processes here in Ecuador, but you'll be even less free from the people that don't even respect the very small bit of process that is in between that data and you. So I, I think that that's a very key thing to try to, uh, to drive home, if it's possible. And I think if you pick a different... Uh, if you pick a different focus, if you're able to pick a sort of different angle and you drive towards that instead of end-to-end -end encrypted phone calls, of end-to-end -end encrypted text messages, of moving away, for example, from the US dollar towards things where you actually have control over it, that is a much better idea in many cases, though very hard to implement. Right? In some cases, it's very difficult because there are these tensions. Like in the case of uh, encrypting phone calls, you will come up with a lot of opposition from police departments who want to be able to wiretap. But fundamentally, we have to remember that they're not at the top of the food chain, despite the fact that they think they are. And this, I mean, it's a really hard sell to tell this to someone who's used to wiretapping people, that they should give up on that. And the reason that they usually don't want to give up on it is because they don't acknowledge that it's happening at a larger scale. But it is happening at a larger scale. So if we change that and we switch the ground on which we're fighting, then it becomes possible for us to have a kind of resistance, to have a kind of independence. And with that, I think, will come a lot of economic reward. For example, most of the world is moving towards a kind of authoritarianism, networked authoritarianism, where there's a lot of censorship, there's a lot of surveillance, a lot of data retention, where there are backdoors built into software, where free software is rejected, proprietary software and proprietary software companies are promoted as if they are somehow a positive influence rather than the blight on the world that they actually are. And if Ecuador chooses a different path, I think it will be a better thing. It'll be better not only from an economics perspective and a human rights perspective, but from a moral perspective. And this is something which each person has to decide, obviously. Um, and I think, obviously, your government, by choosing to endorse free software, has started to make that transition. And that's a very powerful thing. And I think it really leads towards what Patino said when he said that the age of empire is over when he granted Julian Assange asylum. I think that by moving in that direction, it's the right direction to keep moving in. So for example, if Yachai, for example, tells Microsoft that they're not interested, that would be fantastic as well. Or for example, making sure that contracts like that are public from the very beginning so that there can be democratic debate. That's a really positive step. These are the things that allow people to have not only a democratic discussion about all of the topics I'm discussing, but it, it actually allows us to talk about the alternatives which could be presented. The, about the things that, which in theory might be, um, let's say, changing and providing exactly the same service, but you, where you retain your liberty, where you have the ability to change the software, where you have the ability to um, decide if it is actually giving you the security properties or the privacy properties that you'd like. So I think I've almost said everything I wanted to say, and I tried to do it as quickly as possible with apologies to the translator, sorry. Um, but I wanted to set the stage for that, and I wanted to have a little bit of a discussion about it, and I wanted to um, hopefully encourage, you know, where we actually adopt better laws, where we, we encode fundamental basic liberties, where we acknowledge the presence not just of the internet, about the freedom to connect, but really about how the internet and the physical world are not separate from each other, and they never really were, but there's an importance of making sure that the traditions, the hard-run traditions from, for example, union organizing uh, and human rights down to the ability for people to vote or for the ability for people to have privacy in the, in, in the sanctuary of their own home. Those are things which, if we don't fight for them, if we don't really build alternative models to the centralized internet that we have right now, we will lose many of those things because as the internet permeates every aspect of our lives and every physical space that we're in, the things that we had fought so hard for, they will be gone. And in the case of the NSA spying, what we know is that's already the case. 
they are gone. It used to be the case that spying on someone meant when you actually intercepted their communications. And now there's an Orwellian newspeak where people suggest that it, it's only spying if you do a database query and then a human actually looks at it. That is, collect everything all the time. That's not spying, they would assert. But you see, for me, I think that that is spying and that has always traditionally been spying. And the fact that now we're all under surveillance to some degree or another, that suggests to me that maybe we have taken some steps back. We have moved from a place where we needed particularized suspicion to one where generally everyone is under surveillance all the time. And it's up to the mercy of the analyst whether or not you are personally affected, whether or not you were put on a watch list, whether or not you have to live in exile, whether or not you get a drone strike, whether or not you de are denied a visa. And I think if we can switch back to the era where we had private communications, where whole population surveillance wasn't so effective, that's a much better world to be in, and it's one where courts matter again, where the rule of law can actually be enforced in a national sovereign way. And that, that is really fundamentally what we're talking about, and it's really fundamentally what Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, myself, and many other people have been trying to explain, to show that these things, these systems, these overarching spying systems, like the ones the NSA and GCHQ are running, that they are fundamentally, um, you know, they're anathema to liberty, even though they allegedly are, you know, run by democratic organizations. In the case of the NSA, it's supposedly democratically elected government, and it is, but no one in the democratically elected government understands what the NSA does. So it's a little bit strange for me because it's hard to give consent when we don't know about the programs and it's hard for the representatives to have oversight when they can barely read technological documents, maybe actually literally in both cases, but yeah, sort of a slight joke. But um, it's really, to me, it's a very sad thing that, to see that these things have gone this way. But the positive thing is that strong encryption really works that anonymity software like the Tor network really can make it significantly harder for someone to target you or to attack you, to be able to harvest information, that there are pieces of software, but there are architectures which just change the ability for positions of power to even exist at all for general populations. So um, that said, I've used almost exactly 30 minutes, which was what I was hoping for. And then I was hoping that we could have some questions from the audience and try to have a little bit more of an interactive Q&A, if that sounds good. You guys think so? You have any questions? There's a few people. You. You. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, in the gentleman in the front row asks, how big of a task is this? So if you think about the battle against the fascists in the 20th century, this is barely even a fight, right? So this is something we can do in a couple of years, but probably it'll take us longer because it'll be hard to organize. But fundamentally, when we think about things like curing diseases or um, any really hard problem where we don't actually have a clue about how to solve them when we start out, we're in good shape. We actually understand a lot of what needs to be done. So for example, the NSA's uh, four-year strategy plan, which was just released by Laura Poitras and James Risen in the New York Times, um, you know, it out outlines all the things they want. They want legislation to enable spying. They want data retention. They want all the stuff that, article, uh, that the article uh, 474 is, uh, is actually talking about, right? So step one, fuck them, don't give them what they want. Right? And that's like a really key thing. Now that we understand their strategy for undermining democracies, what we need to do is enshrine in law the opposite of that. And not only the opposite, but we need to enshrine in law the alternative that makes it impossible for these people to ever do these things ever again. And to do so democratically. And to do so in a way that it doesn't attract the worst kinds of people. I mean, these kinds of power structures that are not democratically uh, in, in any way enabled, in my opinion, right? I never voted for any NSA analyst in my life, right? So if, if these things are possible, they will attract the worst kinds of people. It will also attract the, the right kind of people, in some case, that want to do good. But it really only takes a few bad actors to really ruin people's lives in a way that is incomprehensible. Like, for example, the NSA has programs where they actually beam high energy radiation into your house to be able to extract information from your computer. It's like something out of a Philip K. Dick novel, which if you haven't read his stuff, he was an optimist. And um, maybe a real optimist, because in his future, it was, uh, there were good drugs also. Um, so, I mean, the NSA really does that kind of stuff. 
Why is that the case? Why is it that we're allowed to have something like that taking place? And why is it that it happens in secret? I mean, it just, to me, it just, it seems like it's obviously morally the wrong thing, but it's also just going to attract the worst kinds of people, and it will be almost impossible to resist it in some cases. You know, and, and in the case of the Iraq war, the NSA, they used their capabilities against the Iraqi people, and they killed somewhere between 100,000 and a million people in that war, which in the, the effects of it are still here today. So this surveillance stuff is actually tied also, for example, to drone strikes in Yemen where they assassinate children, women and children, and regular people, regular men between the ages of 17 and 65, which are considered militants, where the mere crime is the crime of their metadata being like someone that maybe could have been a terrorist. So the suspect essentially means targeted for murder in this case. So this kind of surveillance is not victimless, and it's really just a matter of time before this kind of totalitarianism spreads to other places. So in a sense, if you think about what's coming in the next 10 or 20 years, the task we face now is simple. The task we face in 20 years if we wait to deal with this is really seriously scary. In fact, I don't think it's a solvable task at that point, um, not on a global scale. It will be a locally solvable problem, but it's not on a planetary scale. Uh, I mean, drone strikes are really, uh, they're a taste of what is possible with this kind of surveillance data. So right now, it's a simple task. Encrypt everything, get rid of the planetary surveillance network, really like make sure that all intelligence agencies are brought within the rule of law if they continue to exist as they are now. Making things free software, getting rid of proprietary software companies that could have backdoors, trust but verify, these kinds of things, they're really straightforward. We understand them. It's not like curing cancer. It's not like curing HIV or stopping it in the first place. We don't have any idea about how to do these things for many of the cancers of the world. We don't have a cure for HIV. We only are barely scratching the surface on understanding, you know, even how to vaccinate. So on that sense, it's like really not even a hard problem. That's, a, I mean, it really gives me hope. The thing that doesn't give me hope is there are a lot of people that think that it isn't their problem to solve. But every single person here needs to take on some of the lessons from the fight against HIV. So in the 80s, lots of white guys in California didn't believe that HIV could, it could impact them. And then a really interesting thing happened, which is they all died, right? And they died because they were arrogant sons of bitches and they didn't understand transitive risk. So they didn't understand that when they behaved poorly that their friends and family members would get sick because they thought it was only a gay disease. Surveillance is similar in the sense that there's a transitive risk. When you think you don't have anything to hide, so you don't protect your communications, you actually make your entire community vulnerable. You actually make it such that your transitive risk profile is like an infectious disease. And your information, the information you leak about your friends and about yourself, it actually, for example, can out your friends that may be gay when they're not out. There's studies about this, about Facebook data, about who you're friends with. Merely knowing a social graph can be enough to destroy someone's life in a certain circumstance in a particular context. So really caring about this, even though you might not immediately see why it matters, it, I think, can make a world of difference. And I think what we'll also see is that the lesson of HIV and those men I mentioned before who did not do so well uh, because they didn't want to wear a condom or whatever it was they didn't want to do, they didn't want to get tested because of shame, they didn't want to admit that it was a problem, well, we'll see similar lessons for people. We'll start to see people who are busted by intelligence agencies for things that are totally minor. We'll start to see people that are killed by drone strikes, of which I think probably now it's in the tens of thousands in Yemen and Pakistan. Maybe it's somewhere between 10,000 and 20,000. I'm not exactly sure because the US doesn't release details about the civilians that they kill. So, I mean, I really think that if we can get people to care about it, we can change these these entire discussions, and we can actually not have some of the really awful stuff that has happened in the past repeat over and over and over again. And with that, I think it brings back a kind of national sovereignty. And so it's a really long-winded answer, but <laughs> I really think it's a simple problem if we learn from the past. And we also understand the tendency of empire and how they treat people that are not in the empire, of which all of you are not in the empire right now, especially. And we should try to embrace this idea of universal human rights, regardless of the nation state that people are in. And so if Ecuador chooses to care about this human rights idea, about universal human rights, if it cares to embrace liberty, it can be a bastion of that for the world, the way that Iceland could be with the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, the way that, for example, 
uh, Christiania in Denmark is by trying to create an alternative structure. That's not a great example because it's very small, but it's a great example in terms of the idea, regardless of how big of an actual implementation it is. It's a very brave thing to try to do. Yep. I mean, of course, right? But part of this is actually that I don't think people should have to change their behavior. We should change certain aspects of the systems so that people can continue to behave the way they are now, but the systems actually provide the properties that we think them to. Like, in theory, you have to go to a judge to wiretap someone, even in Ecuador, right? But in practice, I can get a 25 euro cell phone out of my backpack, plug it into my laptop, and intercept your GSM calls without going to a court. We don't have to educate every person about the value of privacy. What we need to do is to educate people who are in a position of democratic representative power to make changes that fundamentally ensure the due process that we expect so that the promises of law match up with the actual delivery that technology brings to us. And that's not such a crazy thing. And in fact, it makes a lot of sense. And there are not a lot of countries that will choose this path. And that's a beautiful advantage from an economic perspective. So again, if you disregard the moral perspective, Many countries will simply choose to be a part of an empire. They will simply choose to spy on people. They will make this decision. Those places will be enslaved, essentially, and they will not be able to change that. They will be, it'll be very difficult to build systems of resistance in those places because these systems can put down any resistance. For example, I met some people when I was living in Argentina for a month with Bruce. I met some people who, um, they were part of the resistance in the Dirty War. And they explained how they organized against the military dictatorship. I could have found every single one of those people in a weekend with the interception gear that is today deployed in a lot of countries. Right? They made phone calls, they met in special places, they had a special setup where they would like ring twice and then they knew that that meant someone had been caught. That kind of resistance is over with this kind of surveillance. And almost all resistance without a free internet is over. So if Ecuador chooses a different route, Ecuador can stay independent, but it can also provide a sort of bastion of liberty to other places, and especially to other people, where their governments have made the wrong choice. For example, Sweden made the wrong choice with the FRA law, and for example, the UK made the wrong choice by not cutting off the Queen's head some several hundred years ago, right? And see what a pickle that Canada is stuck in as a result of that. The governor general can prorogue their democratically elected parliament when Stephen Harper, that giant asshole, is able to say, even un under contempt, he's able to say, hey, I want to suspend the democratically elected parliament. These power structures, when they have surveillance, it's, I mean, it's resistance there is just over. And it means that if you wish to become a politician, every future president of the United States is already under surveillance. So you don't even have to worry about targeting because retroactively you'll be able to go and find the people you now think are interesting and see everything they did. I'm part of the last generation of Americans that was not born under total surveillance. I hope that that's, that is the case that we can extend that to the next couple generations, but it's not a guarantee. And so I really think it's not just about educating the population here, but really some key people. For example, why do cell phone companies here not deploy the strongest crypto? Right? I mean, look at the crypto that's being used by cell phone companies here. Why is it that they deploy proprietary SIM cards, which themselves can be used? Those are little computers inside of the baseband, which is another computer, which is next to the application processor where Android runs. It's like three levels of jailing you. They don't call it a cell phone for nothing, right? So, I mean, I think if we really think about it in this sense, 
it's important to try to imagine in the short term, but also in the long term, the choices we're making right now about how we architect technological societies, they'll really, they'll really have a lot to do with the future and what is even possible in the future. So for example, mandatory identification, making sure you have to carry identification on you at all times. When identification cards have radio uh, frequency transmitters in them, like RFID tags, when you start to have that with cell phones at the same time, you really start to live in a world where total surveillance of all people all the time becomes possible. And what is surveillance if not control? And what is control if not the death of your liberty? When someone chooses this, you will have no choice about it because of the network effect. So really there are some few people in Ecuador that need to be convinced of this and that will set the stage for the rest of the future in Ecuador but in other countries as well. Any other questions? You in the suit. Hello. I mean, I wish I could tell you I had a solution. All I can tell you is that I want to make sure that every American that is in the audience and that is around the world, and just, and I mean South American as well as United States American, Canadian American, et cetera, but the whole world, I want everyone to understand what is happening. And in a sense, it's a little bit like Cassandra syndrome. I don't have a solution. I just want to tell you that you're fucked. That's my, my main goal here right now. But if I were to try to propose to you a solution, what I would say is, think about the proposition here. You know, Sinan, law enforcement and other groups, they, their job is to spy. But the goal of a liberal democracy is to make sure that there are limits on the state and that people themselves retain some liberty and that the state exists to help mediate certain relationships that would be very difficult to mediate without a state. Fundamentally, I think if you choose, for example, breaking into people's computers with tactical malware, you know you've done the wrong thing. You've crossed some lines. If you choose warrantless wiretapping, if you choose targeted, even warranted surveillance, if you choose unencrypted communications, if you choose censorship, those are choosing the immoral and essentially wrong directions in every way, not just technologically, but, but certainly legally and morally, it's going off the deep end, right? It's not respecting what the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights has enshrined as something we should be shooting for. So whenever you hear about something like Article 474, I think that it should be opposed, but not just protested. Right? There's a great uh, German terrorist by the name of Ulrike Meinhof, who you're never supposed to quote in public because you'd never want to dignify everything else she did after she said this. But she said, you know, protest is when I stop going along with the thing, and resistance is when I make sure that everyone else stops going along with it too. Right? She didn't go far enough with her thoughts, and she chose a, a shitty path in life where she used violence. And instead, I would propose, instead of just thinking about protest and resistance, think about building alternatives. Think about how Ecuador could choose to build secure communication solutions that the rest of the world would use because their governments don't respect their rights. Think about the economic benefits that it provides. I mean, if you look at Switzerland and all the blood money they have, imagine if you could do that with privacy and without the guilt. Ecuador could do that. And that's actually a simple thing where the law can respect it. So for example, get rid of MasterCard and Visa and replace it with Bitcoin, right? That would be a really great thing because that's a thing which doesn't have a centralized bank, it doesn't have a corporation, it doesn't have all of the things behind some of these other systems which are not beneficial to Ecuador or to you as a human being. I'm not saying Bitcoin is a perfect solution, but if you look towards decentralized systems, you can be sure that they will be more favorable to you almost always than centralized systems which are corrupted and designed to have a power, a hegemony over you. And so when the laws are designed to reduce the liberty of an individual, you can be sure that that, especially when it comes with technology, you can be sure that that's the wrong path to be on, especially when you think about the long arc of history. So I hope that answers your question, gentlemen in the suit. Second question? How about three, since this is your third? Mm 
So I think that um, the president of Brazil is pretty pissed off about the NSA spying on her. And that's good. So I look forward to her disbanding their secret police and their spying agencies too, right? So she should put her money where her mouth is. And I think she will to some extent. And I think enshrining these things in the United Nations, uh, expanding the basic rights, I think that's very good. But I think a key thing is that there's always this conflict where countries will say they want to get rid of you know, illegal spying, and they'll say, but this legal spying over here that we do, that's fine. So I really hope that what we'll see is that there's this discussion where we realize we actually, if we weaken our systems, if we allow for some kinds of spying that, that everybody loses on the big scale, because there are players which are at the top, right? Each state tries to think of itself as at the top of the world, but it's really not. Many of them are, in fact, in a hierarchy where they're nowhere near the top. So I like the ideas that she's talking about. I like the idea of decentralizing the internet. I like the idea of, for example, supporting a lot more crypto. I like the idea of this idea that we have privacy on the internet as we do in real life. But I do, I do have a little bit, uh, I mean, Dao Aung San Suu Kyi would say, I'm cautiously optimistic, I suspect. And that's, that's where I'm at, because Brazil still is going to do wiretapping they're still probably going to be spying on the internet just the same way that the NSA does at a different scale. I hope they don't make that choice, but I suspect that it, the, there are very powerful lobbies that will suggest that they need to. And fundamentally, this is a great battle um, where the NSA wins the whole time they're having it and in the end if they continue to do spying. And it's not just the NSA that wins, right? Because ultimately, the Chinese and the Russians are gonna have the same level of spying as the Americans. And I think they'll be significantly less benevolent the more and more that we see these systems expand, there'll be less and less benevolent countries. And I'm not saying the US is perfectly benevolent, um, but boy, I don't like the idea of all of them having that power, right? That's especially scary. So I, I'm, I'm hopeful, right? Because she was personally affected. And you know, the thing that changed Dianne Feinstein's opinion about the NSA was our reporting with, with Chancellor Merkel. Because you know, when someone she respects was spied on, then she finally thought it was out of control. So I think the same thing is happening in Brazil, and I really hope we'll see a consistent, thorough approach by Brazil that leads the way, and even Trump, trumps what Germany is doing, since they're doing it together. I hope that Brazil really leads the way, and I hope that Ecuador actually does too, right? I mean, there is a special collection system here in Quito. You can probably see it on the US Embassy. I haven't gone, I'm, I'm gonna go tomorrow and look. But if other countries, if they choose this, and they choose the same thing and they support Brazil, I think it's more likely that Brazil will move further and further in the direction of liberty and further and further away from this criminal spying. So I'm cautiously optimistic and extremely long-winded. Other questions? Yeah, so the first and the second question basically have the same answer, which is that uh, I think that people in general don't understand these things. And if you ask them in a way that they don't understand, then they will not assert that they understand, that they will take action, or that they care. So fundamentally, we have to make sure that there is some kind of informed consent, and then without it, we should not allow it to happen. Right? I think, for example, most people don't understand the tasking-based selector surveillance I just described. And they shouldn't, because that's crazy stuff where you have to specialize for years and years and years to really comprehend it. Right? I just barely understand it, and I've been working on counter-surveillance anonymity technologies for a decade. And, I mean, people actually, in my experience, when you frame it in a way that 
reaches them as people. They really care, and they immediately take action to, to, to correct what they perceive as the problem. So an easy test for this, if you want to see if someone really cares, and if they really will take action, is to ask them to strip off their clothes. And the reason is because almost everyone reasonably will say no. And when you ask them why they shouldn't when you order them to, they should say, because it's my choice and I choose not to. Right? And it is the case that most of the time, they don't get that choice. And most of the time, this is taken from them. And in some cases, they don't even understand that that's what you were asking of them in the first place. And so they say something like, oh, I have nothing to hide. But it's not about hiding. It's about having dignity. It's about having a choice. It's about having a say in how our lives are organized and about what other people can do with that data. So do they care? When you frame it that way, they usually do care. And they usually say that you're not the boss of them and they're not, that you don't get to take that away from them. And will they make this change? It depends. Do they have an option? Like it's just because someone's on Facebook, that doesn't mean that they don't care. In fact, it is the case, it means that they don't have another option because a capitalist corporation has replaced the space that the, that the city square used to take. It has replaced the communication networks that we used to use with telephones or with meeting in person. And so without alternatives, it's very difficult to say that someone cares or doesn't care based on some of these choices. We don't have alternative distributed social media which is run democratically. So the use of social media is because anything else would be to be at a loss for this communication. So I really do think people care if you ask them the right way. And I really think they'll take action when they can meaningfully take that action. In most places, there is no meaningful action to take. And that is because people are not free. They're not free to choose something else. And in some cases, they'll be penalized for choosing things which give them a little bit of liberty. And in some cases, those things will be actively sabotaged. The Chinese government, for example, actively sabotages people trying to use Tor. So there are lots of people that really care about this. And when they assert that caring, they're put down for that. And so it's very easy to think that people don't care. And it's very easy to think that they don't want to learn. But I think that that's just about how bad we are at asking this question and uh, how bad we are with rhetoric, actually. And really, if you ask a person, do you wish to have liberty? Do you wish to be free? Do you wish to have human rights respected? There are a few people that would say anything other than, of course. Uh, right, I, I, see that you, I see that you missed my point. Right, okay, so I'll, I'll try again for a different angle. People don't understand and they don't give informed consent and they have one choice to keep their job. They click agree on a license agreement. What choice do they have otherwise? What choice do they have other than clicking agree? In many cases, they don't have another choice. And that does not mean that they don't care. It means that they don't care about the power you assert over them if it's a choice between that power and, for example, keeping their job or doing a specific task. Like they, they, they think that they can get away with it. In the long run, it may not be the case that they'll be able to be free. In the case of simple things like using proprietary software to like edit an image, you know, that's a kind of freedom which you can argue is an okay trade-off. But there are other trade-offs that are made where they don't they don't uh, have such positive outcomes, I think. And I really think it's key to understand that if they don't have an alternate option for choosing, that doesn't mean that they don't care. It means that they really want to do this thing and that's the best thing that they can do right now, right? I mean, for example, the Dutch, the British, uh, the Belgians, they have uh, monarchies. Does that mean you don't care about democracy? No, of course not. You don't have a meaningful option to get rid of the monarchy usually. It doesn't mean that you don't care. It just means that there are options presented to you and one of them is not that you'll actually be free from the tyranny of heredit hereditary power, right? And I would never fault someone living in one of those societies saying that they obviously don't care about democracy because what meaningfully can one person do about that? Right? I mean, there's a context to these things. So with free software, with communication security especially, we must not attack the victim by suggesting that they just don't care because they don't choose something else. I mean, I choose not to be on Facebook, but I can get away with that because I don't, I don't want it, right? But most people can't. They have a family which they would communicate on Facebook with. So they need that. And there is no meaningful alternative, but we can build those alternatives, right? What Dimitri has been basically talking about for years, 
That's the kind of stuff we need to work on building. And then when people choose between Facebook and say whatever he comes up with, we could say they don't care. But what we might also say is that they still don't understand. Because it's very difficult to understand what this means in a long-term and in a short-term sense. Right, I mean, you, you probably use US dollars while you're here. Does that mean you don't care about drone strikes? I mean, it's like false dichotomies are present everywhere, right? Maybe we should try to think about it differently. What meaningful alternative is presented? What real informed consent actually exists? What can we actually do about it? And the first thing we can do is identify that it is wrong and to inform people about it and then to work to build alternatives. And we really can do that. And the free software movement of Ecuador, like the free software movements all around the world, they're working to do exactly that. So you should come join us and not blame the victim. Yep. That's awful. That's really awful. I'm very sorry to hear that that happened. Have you heard of other cases like this? I mean, I have. I mean, I have heard, for example, of the case of Jeremy Hammond, who was using Tor when he talked to that awful, awful snitch, Sabu, or Hector Monsavada, or whatever his name is. Monsigo. What is it? Monsigo. Monsa motherfucker. Anyway, that guy. What a total piece of shit, that guy. He also, Sabu also tried to entrap me, personally, by the way, just as a side note. But Jeremy was using Tor, and the FBI and Sabu collaborated against him to try to destroy his anonymity, and they decided it was good enough, and so they went after him, and he was a Tor user, and now he's in prison for 10 years. The difference being, of course, that he had done other things, he admitted to it, and it's a very complicated case, but uh, he was also, the FBI really entrapped him and used him quite a lot. Um, I have some friends in Syrian prisons right now who were Tor users. They weren't jailed for being Tor users. They were jailed because of the genocide that is happening there and their resistance to the genocide. Um, I have some, you know, other acquaintances in other places around the world where, you know, privacy-enhancing technology has been, in a sense, protecting the specifics of what they're doing, but it has attracted attention, which is negative. But on the other side, without the privacy-enhancing technologies, visiting a specific website of the resistance or vi visiting a specific server or using a specific communications program would directly allow them to link them to a specific thing that would cause even more harm. And this is a, I mean, it's just a sad fact, which is that until we have these properties normalized as part of everything that we do, it will always be possible to try to hunt down a specific person or a specific minority of people and then to blame them just for using those tools. And I'm really sad to hear that that happened to this person. And I've actually not heard of someone being jailed for four years simply for using Tor. And it sounds like maybe some Tor people should go to Colombia to try to educate people about Tor. I so potentially, right? I mean, one of the things that we have to consider is that it may be the case that we will see even more repression when more people use privacy enhancing technologies. And part of the point of normalization here is that regular people really don't have a lot of great options. I mean, Tor is not perfect by far, right? But it really makes the NSA and GCHQ and other agencies' lives harder. And it makes generally spying significantly harder, especially when they're watching your home internet connection to try to pin something on you or to try to harm you in some way, like to break into your computer, with the man in the middle attack or a man on the side attack. And I mean, the short version of it is that if we can normalize this behavior, it will improve to some extent the way that we accept this, right? So criminals have a 
criminal, some, such a good guy, bad guy, is such a simple way of looking at it, right? But there are fundamentally people who don't want to follow the rules, and they have great privacy properties because they can mug you and take your phone, they can clone a cell phone, they can use your Wi-Fi network, they can break into another network. Like, they can have privacy that regular people can't have. And what Tor aims to do is to give every person privacy without engaging in something that is criminal. But there are places, and apparently Colombia is one of them, where when you are politically a target, that anything where you try to protect yourself from the totality of the state, it will be used against you. But it probably would have been the case that if they had been using Skype or another technology that similarly thwarted the state, the thing is that resistance in this case is what they're going after, political resistance. So we have to recognize that there are some places where it's just dangerous to use these communication technologies overall. Sometimes the right option is to not use the internet, right? And that's unfortunate, it's not realistic as time goes on. So hopefully we can normalize it in places like that. And I, I'm horrified to hear that about this woman in Colombia. And if it would be helpful, I'm, I know that myself and other tour people would be happy to go and explain, for example, to Colombians and to Colombian law enforcement. I'm not good for talking to the police, but there are other tour people that are very good at that. Um, and I mean, to explain the necessity of this. Um, I mean, last I checked, there was more than one tour user in Colombia because we have metrics about this on metrics.tourproject.org. Um, but I suspect that, I mean, in this case, it sounds like the person could have just, I mean, man, it's fucked. It's totally fucked. I'm so sorry to hear that. But if it's possible to help this group of people to, like, give them more privacy-enhancing technologies, and it won't create more harm, I'd be happy to try to help with that. So, God, that's awful. Yeah. Uh, maybe not directly. Maybe it's, I, that could be more harmful to them than to me, actually. You have a question? Uh, well, yeah, no, I totally agree, right? Every time a police officer that commits police brutality acts against protesters, every time they use the Tor network, it makes me really sad, right? And seriously, right? Because when violent criminals use anonymity tools, that, that makes me sad. But for you to have privacy from those same violent criminals, I think it's good that we have a positive legal option. I think it's really important. And also there are different kinds of bad people, right? A human rights dissident in Burma that I work with needs something like Tor to stay alive or he will end up in a work camp, right? I need Tor so that when the FBI is trying to break into my computers or when they're trying to harm me because they don't like my politics, I have something to protect myself, right? And the FBI would assert that I'm a bad guy because I care about you. I care about your freedom and your liberty just as much as I care about mine because I think about it in terms of a common humanity, not just in terms of nation states and dominance. So bad guys in this case is really relative. I mean, the war on some drugs, I mean, maybe I'm going way off the deep end here, but what is the drug war except a class war, right? And what is that class war? It's asserting that people who in many cases are sick, that they should be imprisoned, that they should be harmed. So, I mean, I actually don't think very much about the Silk Road. I mean, it's just, just a website, it doesn't really matter. But when I think about what anonymity technologies bring to us, I think that they bring for us a way to set right where when someone would assert that you're a bad guy, they have total control over you, often before you've even seen a court or a judge has been consulted. And it gives you some of that liberty back. And it gives it back, even though some shitty people, like cops that commit police brutality against you, even though those guys also get privacy, it fundamentally makes sure that everybody has some privacy. And that, to me, is a worthwhile trade-off. If I thought it was primarily only used by those shitty cops, then I would feel differently. But when I see who here in the room uses Tor, Right? So what about bad guys using Tor, right? I, I, I was in Tunisia after Ben Ali's regime was taken down. And I worked very hard on helping to overthrow the Ben Ali regime for several years with Semi Ben Garbia, who's a friend of mine. And boy, a funny thing happened in the university. Roger Dingledine and I were speaking, and um, it was great. This woman said in the class, well, what about all the bad people that the internet censorship blocked? And so I said, hey, who here in this room saw Amar 404? That was the name of the block page in, uh, in, in Tunisia. And every person raised their hand, including the woman that asked the question. And I said, yes, so what about all the bad people surrounding you? Right? What was that censorship for? It wasn't actually for stopping bad people by what you imagined to be a bad person. It was about stopping people who challenged Ben Ali's power, including yourself and every other person in this classroom. 
And so fundamentally, we have to think about who's bad people, and aren't you one of the bad people in this case, right? So I think it's much better off that some bad people in some cases have what you could call bad people privacy than for nobody to have any privacy except people that have a position of wealth and power and that are at the top of a society in terms of class structure, right? Regular people need privacy and anonymity more than anyone else, actually, because usually that your life does not come with the same wealth and class privileges. So we really need this for every person, every union worker that wants to organize, every person who wants to even know if they should join a union should be able to inquire about that without presenting themselves as someone who is doing that. We should be able to be free to do this. This is really important. And actually buying into this rhetoric that bad people use anonymity technologies is really buying into the rhetoric that there should be no limit to the amount of spying that's taking place and that people should be always answering questions from authorities when they ask them, that they should absolutely be not at liberty, but rather under siege. And I just, I fundamentally just don't buy it. And I don't think you should either. And I would hope that in the future, when you ask about bad people, you should ask whether or not you should retain some agency to defend yourself and to ensure that there's due process. And so there'll be some shitheads that use this badly, of course, that'll always happen. But you won't have a lot of other options in my mind. And that's why I care about this. That's why I do this. Because in places like Burma, in places like the United States, there are power structures which fundamentally are very harmful to a lot of people in an unjust way. And we need a common anonymity technology where everybody from anarcho-syndicalists to hardcore capitalists work together to give that anonymity to each other. Because when we all work together, we actually get it. And when we limit it to just a certain set of people, we know that we don't all get it. And not only that, those people don't even get it because only the limited set of people have it. Probably haven't convinced you, but I urge you to consider to not support abuse of police in the future, just to sort of troll you a little bit. Any other questions? Well, bad, so I mean, if you have a problem with someone using the Tor network in a bad way, let's say like, they use the Tor network to like break into a website or something like that. You have two problems, right? One is that someone's a jerk and they broke into your website. And the other is that you ran an insecure website. Now, you shouldn't blame the victim who runs the insecure website. But you should recognize that because someone runs an insecure website, we shouldn't give up fundamental civil liberties. Any other questions? One in the back, yeah? Yeah, so fundamentally this is about economics. And one of the things to understand is that encryption software, really it buys you time. Crypto buys you time. Privacy in general, it buys you some time. It's not meant as a panacea. It doesn't solve everything. And this is about also about economics of scale. The spying is possible for really f almost nothing per day per person because of the architecture of the internet, because of the architecture of telephone networks. And because a few corporations are in bed with governments and often with each other and they share this information. I mean we live in the golden age of signals intelligence, the golden age of spying, the golden age of wiretapping and whole life monitoring and if we work together we can end it and that's the thing. We can end it, we can make the cost very high. It will not stop the spying on someone like Julian, right? Julian for the rest of his life will always be under surveillance because they will always assert as much power as is possible. Not just to break the crypto but to bug the room that he's stuck in for example. You know, crypto can't solve that problem. And fundamentally, this is the thing. People who are really bad actors, they make a lot of mistakes. And not only do they make a lot of mistakes, they rely on lots of systems and they interact with them. And one of the systems that provides with a lot, a lot of people with liberty is Tor. But they're going to interact with many systems like that. I'd like to live in a world where you had privacy in economic transactions, in communications that you have, in traveling. We'll get back to that world, I think. And yes, there will be some not so fantastic people that come to that world with us. But we can build it in a way where we can try to enshrine some of the values that we really care about, that we really want to live under. We can build that together. And with cryptography, 
you can buy that time, I think, to get us there to some extent. And right now, yeah, I don't think we're there yet. And so even though there is an anonymity network that works for, let's say, millions of people every day, there are seven billion people on the planet. So it's, I mean, we're barely scratching the surface on protecting ourselves, unfortunately. All right, you're all falling asleep. I bored the shit out of you. I'm so sorry. Um, are there any other questions before I stop talking? Surely one of you has one more question. Are there any women in the audience that want to ask a question? Since uh, I think mm, almost no women asked questions. Any? No? That's really sad. Are you sure? Going once? <laughs> Going twice? How about you? You look like you want to ask a question? No? All right. Maybe not. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, so tomorrow we're going to have a hackathon where we're going to hack on ORCID. I've also brought a hardware prototype of what we were calling the Tor router, um, which um, we want to work on getting Debian working on it really well. Um, we're just generally going to hack on free software, free software for freedom. And um, the Free Software Association of Ecuador that's really helped put a lot of this together that has brought us here, I really want to thank them for making this possible. This guy in the blue tie who I've never seen in a tie before. Right? I mean, and I mean, obviously, there are lots of people here. Rafa, for example, I really thank you everyone for bringing me and a lot of the other people here. And this hackathon, we're going to work on some cool stuff together. And I hope that you guys, if you're interested, will come. And even if you don't want to actually hack on something, you just want to learn how to use some of the software, I suspect there will be people here that would love to talk about that. Um, and in general, I'll be in Ecuador for a couple of more days at least, hopefully. And if things go really bad, maybe forever. But, uh, you know. Just kidding, I hope. Uh, <clears throat> whew. So that said, it's been a blast. Uh, oh, you have a question. All right, last one. Okay. No, I don't think you should. I don't think you should force people to use Tor. I, I generally think that you should. I, don't, I, don't, I generally think that you should not force people to do things against their will without without them basically choosing it. I think if you run a, a, an open Wi-Fi network, though, you could very easily route all the traffic through Tor. And I think that's fine because it's your network, and people should treat your network as hostile anyway. And if, in the case, the hostility pr that it presents is to your ISP instead of to the user, that's fine. But I don't think you should try to sneak Tor into some other application. And if you want to learn how Tor works. Come tomorrow, we can talk about the Tor specification. We can talk about uh, how the software functions or about the general ideas about the anonymity research field. I'm happy to talk about that with you. And um, then maybe you can teach people and they can choose instead of forcing them. And I think that if they learn about why they would want to do it, they may choose that. Some obstinate people will choose not to, but that's okay. We learned about those guys I mentioned in the 80s. Fate has a way of teaching them hard lessons. So. Um, Thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Oh, you, wait, oh, you, all right. Woohoo. And so I totally agree that, that it's good to enshrine privacy by design and law. He was, I think, maybe I'm wrong, but he was suggesting more like we slip in Tor to everything. And I think, I think, well, that's admirable. We should try to do it in a legal sense. We should try to improve people's privacy. And we should recognize that many corporations do not care about anything except for profit. And we should try to protect people. And this is not so hard to do in, in law. 
if there's the political will to do it. And I think that's something we should be doing. And we should just make sure the technology and the law actually match up. Because right now, what we have is that the law says one thing, and the technology allows these guys to do whatever they want. And then they do whatever they want, and you have no ability to do anything about it, except try to move the law and the technology in that direction of liberty. So I think that's a great point to end on, which is that we should try to improve the laws. I mean, really, this article, uh, 474, don't let it pass. Every person here, if you do one thing, it's not to use Tor. It's make sure that laws like this, that, mandato that mandatorily require data retention, that essentially get rid of the really good things that currently exist in Ecuador, that is, without having to show ID, without being subject to dragnet surveillance, to really get rid of laws like that and replace them with positive laws, positive laws that make it so that you could use Tor to visit a website, and if they block it, they're committing the criminal action because you have a right to privacy. That's a way better choice. And if you can make that possible in your democracy, please make it happen. It'll make it so that it's possible for us to, I think, build alternative structures on top of these systems here in Ecuador and elsewhere. So I know there are more questions, but it's 8.20, and I feel like half the people here, their bladders are exploding. So I mean, do you guys mind if I take two more questions? Is that OK? It's OK? OK, what's your question? Eh, es un anuncio que quiero hacer. El día de ayer, la vice, subsecretaria general de Cenecid pidió a la comunidad construir una ley sobre software, ¿ya? Y la pidió públicamente. Entonces, eh, estando hablando, estamos hablando de construir una nueva ley y creo que sería la oportunidad de decirles que tenemos esa oportunidad. Va a haber una reunión el viernes a las 3 de la tarde en las oficinas de Thoughtworks y están todos invitados. Es en la República del de Salvador y Suecia. Suiza. Suiza. Edificio. Precia. Brescia, Brescia con B grande. Bueno, eh, trataremos de pasar esto en la página web del evento en minga.es. ¿no? Gracias. Cool. Okay, so I really think I should finish here, but if you have a quick question, go for it. 